ตัสมะคะวะโตอาระหะโตสมาสมพุทธะสะนโมตัสสะมะคะวะโตอาระหะโตสมาสมพุทธะสะนโมตัสสะมะคะวะโตอาระหะโตสมาสมพุทธะสะพุทธังธรรมังสังฆังนุตรังปัจายังนามาสัมเมสวัสดีค่ะขอเชิญมา Uh, respectful greetings to any members of the sangha who may be uh, watching this video today, and my blessings to all the lay um, <coughs> lay Buddhists. So we are in um, unprecedented times. This uh, week we will be um, celebrating. And we saw a puja, and for the first time since I came to Thailand, 40 more years now, um, we'll uh, cancel all the um, circumambulation, candlelight circumambulation, and monasteries throughout Thailand, throughout the world. Uh, Are closed. In many places, the monks are going on arms round, and uh, everything seems to be uh, on pause. Um, s t o been suspended animation. Everyone's perception of the passing of time has been distorted. But w i s a k a is. Um, a good opportunity, I think, to to recollect that there are certain things that change, or everything, uh, almost everything changes. Um, but there is the akalika t a m a which is the dhamma, which is which is timeless, and that. It is in our aspiration to realize the deathless, the timeless, that we cultivate the tools, and the virtues that enable us to live within the world of change, in a way that we can. Both create happiness and true welfare for ourselves and for others. <clears throat> so, change is the one most important object or subject of our study. As Buddhists, um, we don't put the same emphasis on faith in dogmas that most other religions do. Um, our emphasis is on study, education, cultivation, development of our understanding of ourselves as human beings and the world we live in. This is our Primary task, and the more that we look at our body, our mind, the more we look at the world we live in, um, the more clearly we see a n i c a n The more clearly we see change, and we become more sophisticated and aware of the different kinds of change that take place. That is to say, that can be very Slow, steady, predictable kinds of changes take place, 
and there can also be sudden, unpredictable changes. Uh, merely observing the variety of kinds of change already gives gives us a certain level of wisdom that we don't expect things to change only in the orderly, predictable way and feel overwhelmed or panic-stricken or angry when things change in the unpredictable, unexpected ways. You say, yeah, it's, that's, that's change. It's like this. Uh, the world is like this. The body is like this. The mind is it's like this. Um, things are changing. And understanding change um, is um, something that we need to give greatest importance to. But it's not just um, the fact that things change, but also that they change according to causes and conditions. This is not a random change, or these are not changes that are part of a, uh, the plan of a creator God. These are changes um, that take place through a very complex, um, unimaginably complex web of causes and conditions. But in this uh, huge web of causes and conditions, um, we only really need to be interested or give our greatest um, amount of time to those changes which um, have an effect on our mind and body. And Buddha taught very simply that um, we suffer because of ignorance and the cravings that arise together with ignorance, um, and that we free ourselves from suffering as through the abandonment of defilement, um, which is affected through the Eightfold Path. <clears throat> and this path from suffering to liberation, from suffering to being caught up with and uh, carried along by the stream of change, um, to the realization of the timeless and the deathless. This um, is a possibility. It is a potential uh, for all human beings um, from whatever country, from whatever continent they come, uh, whether men or women, young or old, uh, rich or poor. Um, and this is um, one of our um, key um, Buddhist um, convictions um, that we all um, bear within us um, the potential for enlightenment. And on uh, the Wisaka um, day, 2,500 and more years ago, um, we can say that the Bodhisattva realized enlightenment, became Buddha as a representative of the human race. Um, he proved through his enlightenment that enlightenment is a possibility. It is a realistic goal uh, to aim for in life. So our conviction, our belief in the enlightenment of the Buddha implies, I would say, a belief in the potential for all human beings to realize enlightenment. And that also, uh, the nested within that, there is perhaps the most Im important insight or understanding, and that is that we, each one of us, um, bears within us that potential. And we can begin to put that conviction, 
add belief to the test by trying to abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, purify the mind. And every time that we um, are able to abandon the unwholesome or develop the wholesome, even in the small mundane matters, uh, then reminding ourselves that this is um, added proof that we can do this. It's not beyond us. And we're looking very closely. We're putting our effort is into um, putting to the test those things that we take on faith or on, uh, on trust. And the more we practice, um, the more we see the results of practice, then the stronger our conviction grows. So our faith is not in things that uh, we have no possibility of ever realizing as a direct experience, um, but our testing of our faith um, can occur throughout the day, every day. And we look at the, the body and we look at the mind and we see, we see what? We see things arising and passing away. And we see the arising of defilement in the mind, for instance. Now in the, um, this year, um, people are having um, far more time to be by themselves, uh, probably uh, other than monastics or um, dedicated meditators, probably more than ever before. And that can be um, both a blessing and a curse in that without right view, the habit accumulated over countless lifetimes is to assume and to um, believe, uh, we can say superstitious, believe that every mental state is who we are. And so without the um, right view that the Buddha taught us, uh, people can become overwhelmed um, by the negative mental states that they discover when they are suddenly deprived of all means of distraction. For Buddhist meditators, um, we have the advantage of our initial belief that mental states are not self, they're not who we are, they're not, they don't belong to us. But in the practice now, we're, we're looking very closely. Is that true? And we can see that in the a second before you have a sort of fear, anxiety, um, uh, confusion, doubt, anger, the second before that appears in your mind, you have absolutely no conception that that will arise in your mind. There it is. Suddenly it's there. And if your mindfulness is very sharp, you will observe that initially there is no sense that that is who you are, that that is your mental state, your weakness, your fault. But that there is a grasping on to the mental state. And then there is a um, adding on to a proliferation of the mental state, making a story out of it. And this clear seeing um, is, is what allows us to, to let go. It's not we're trying to persuade ourselves um, that mental states are not self in order to be a good Buddhist, 
but we're taking the hypothesis and putting it to the test. And we're looking very closely. You see, yeah, it just arises. And it stays for a while, and then it passes away. And then we observe also the state after it's passed away. So close, uh, interested, relaxed observation without wanting to feel anything, without wanting to get rid of anything, but just looking and having that relaxed, interested, curious kind of looking like, like, say like a child, you take a child to the zoo the first time and the child looking through the cages at all the strange creatures. That's how you look at mental states. You know, it's just, uh, um, they can't get at you, they're behind bars. You know, you just, you just look at them and uh, as long as you don't climb through the bars and, and uh, grab onto one, it can't do anything to you. You're just looking at it. So interest, curiosity, enjoyment. Um, and the mental states that arise, arise, why do they arise? Well, because they've arisen in the past. Um, you've indulged in them, you've identified with them, you've been fooled by them in the past, and that's the karmic energy which leads to them reappearing in your mind. But when you're simply watching uh, and not adding on to them, and not fighting with them, not being oppressed by them, um, then they lose a little bit of energy. Each time you do that, you fade away. So there are, when we see this, we don't have to fear. You know, it's not just um, that anxiety is suffering, but the, the fear of not wanting to be anxious um, and feeling overwhelmed by anxiety. Um, it's like adding poison to the arrow in, in the Buddhist simile. See, so, yeah, it's like this. This is what anxiety is like. This is what fear is like this feels like this in the body, feels like this in the mind. And we don't add to it, we can watch it pass away. Oh, it arises and passes away. And, and we, um, we can see that the more we do this, then the more the mind is impressed by the process rather than the content of mental states. So there are two aspects of mental state. There's a, what the content of it is, how it feels, or what the thoughts that constitute it are. And there is the, um, the other aspect is that it rises and passes away. And the most exalted mental states, the most awful, nasty mental states seen as processes, they're just one thing, they arise and they pass away. So we're developing this ability to see, to understand, penetrate the nature of things. But our, our ability to do that um, is um, dependent upon how we take care of our, our body, our speech, and our mind, and um, regular chanting, meditation practice, in order to um, learn the skills of uh, focus and developing the um, strength of mindfulness and uh, sampajanya, clear comprehension, and atapi, it's like the appropriate effort, not too tight, not too loose. And these are skills that, that we uh, need to develop how to protect the mind from unarisen, unwholesome dhammas, to let go of arisen, wholesome dhammas, to bring into the mind, to introduce into the mind uh, wholesome dhammas that have not yet appeared, learning how to take care of those that have appeared. So these are all ways in which we are bringing the mind to a sense of maturity and readiness um, and a strength and a flexibility um, and an integrity which allows the wisdom 
to penetrate deeply within us. So we have these teachings. Um, the teachings are um, all the teachings that we need to follow in the footsteps of the Arahants, the footsteps of the Buddha himself. Um, we are in the fortunate position of uh, having access to those teachings. Um, the, uh, the great monks and nuns and practitioners over the past 2,000 more years have preserved these teachings and transmitted them and put them to the test and proved through their lives that they are timeless. It's not just that um, beings with great spiritual potential at the time of the Buddha uh, could follow in the Buddha's footsteps. Um, but this teaching is the truth of um, the body and the mind and the truth of what creates suffering and what alleviates suffering. And uh, thanks to the efforts, goodness and kindness and compassion of countless beings over the past centuries, then we have this uh, opportunity to um, apply these teachings to our own life um, and then to share what we have um, realized uh, with others. So uh, Wisaka Pujara is, is a day where we can uh, reflect on this and our debt of gratitude to uh, the Lord Buddha, debt of gratitude to the teachings, um, debt of gratitude to the uh, the, the Arya Pugala, the, the, um, the Sangha of enlightened disciples who have taken care of his teachings and preserved them uh, for all of us. But our duty as, as Buddhists is not simply to um, feel that sense of gratitude, but to try to repay that gratitude by applying those teachings. So the the um, the changes that are taking place they're just they're just change. Um, the challenge of adapting to the changes brought on by the coronavirus are in essence no different from uh, the changes that are taking place. Um, in our life at any at any time. Um, it's learning how to um, cultivate our body, speech and mind um, in the best possible way. There are all kinds of um, questions ahead and unresolved issues in the world and um, nobody really knows um, what the world's going to be like after this virus um, has disappeared or has been reduced um, to a manageable level. And uh, it's right now, uh, it's nothing more than speculation. But what we can take responsibility for, and we could, is uh, what we can do. What can you do right now, this morning, this afternoon, this evening? You know, not what might happen or what you might be able to do in the future. But in this particular time, this particular year, then let's put our, our effort into uh, the present moment and creating the causes and conditions for acting in the most mindful, wise, compassionate uh, way possible in the future. Um, so I would um, like to uh, offer my uh, my best wishes and, and blessing for, for you all to uh, to grow in dana, sila, pawana, for the uh, members of the sangha, for sila, samati, uh, banya. Uh, may you be able to put to the test of your own experience all of the teachings of the Buddha um, and to realize, ultimately, uh, realize the timeless, the, the deathless uh, truth that the Buddha himself realized on uh, the day that we now um, celebrate as Misaka Pujan.